Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Sports Wrap-Up here on CSB9. I'm your host, Paul Kelly, and on tonight's edition, we'll have a special show for you. We'll be previewing the Penn Quakers' upcoming football season, which kicks off Saturday as Penn will be at Jacksonville University. Later on, we'll check out the Quakers' schedule, and we'll play an interesting segment from my radio show for you. But we're going to get started tonight by recapping Penn's Media Day. Myself and the rest of the Sports Wrap-Up crew attended Penn's Media Day at Franklin Field and teamed up with the Penn Sports Network. The big attraction for us here on Sports Wrap-Up was head coach Al Bagnoli, who's entering his 23rd and final season at Penn. Here's Brian Seltzer with more. In addition to it being Al Bagnoli's final season with the Quakers, another theme, the way that last year wrapped up, two really bizarre games to end the season against Harvard on the road and versus Cornell right here at Franklin Field. And there's a definite sense of purpose, focus, and hunger about this year's Quaker team as reflected by the tone set from some of the veteran leaders. Making sure you go all out to you know, get ready for the game day. Personal story, you had to deal with injury, battle you What was the type of example you put out of this? Um, again, it's just about working hard, you know, coming back from the injury. It was just all about being persistent and you know, doing the right things every day and uh, working hard every day. So, you know, it's something you have to battle through. It's unfortunately a part of the game. And uh, unfortunately, I had to deal with that. But, you know, we bounce back and uh, try to come back strong. Now, coming into the season, a little bit different. You know, you have uh, Ray will be yeah, uh, taking yeah. over for you. How do you plan to manage the team and like the, and your working well, it, relationship? It's, it's, it? it's no different than what it's been. Uh, the area that's been a little bit different, it's been on the recruiting side. And so when we sat down and figured out how to divvy up responsibilities, anything that has to do with this season. So we're talking about practices. We're talking about travel. We're talking about depth charts, any of those in-season things, nothing has changed. Everything's going through me. When we're talking about futuristic things, all right, we're evaluating two quarterbacks, which one to take. Uh, I've let Ray and the staff make that decision because really that's going to fall more into his jurisdiction. So I don't want to be the one making that decision and overriding Ray. Uh, you know, he's, he's run everybody by me and said, hey, what do you think? You know, which, I, which has been great. Uh, but I want to give him a platform to kind of formulate his own recruiting class. And I want him to get him in front of our coaches a little bit, just so the coaches have an expectation of how a staff meeting is run with a different guy. So it's, it's worked out pretty well. Al, going, speaking of the quarterback, yeah. what, what, could you update us on the situation right now? Well, Alec Torgelson, you know, is our number one guy. Pat Chiller is our number two guy. Uh, Alec, you know, has a world of ability. Uh, we kind of threw him in in the last quarter of the Cornell game last year, quitted himself really well with very little game experience, very little practice. Uh, Patton has done a really nice job through the spring, through the summer. So, uh, you know, it's a nice two-man competition. But right now, if we had to start our season tomorrow, it would be <coughs> Alec backed up by Patton. They've gone back and forth times in the last couple of years, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, two in the game even sometimes. Does it really seem like it's just going to be one guy this year? Well, again, we, we were kind of forced to evaluate what the skill set of our quarterback was. So if you go back to recent history, uh, we had to protect ourselves in the event a running quarterback got hurt. And so that's, that's what really got us into two quarterback systems. It, it, you know, I'm not sitting here saying that's absolutely the right thing to do, but if your number one quarterback is going to carry the ball 10, 15, 20 times a game, uh, you almost got to treat him like a tailback. So with that being in mind, we didn't want to go in a scenario where if Billy did get dinged up and twisted his ankle, we had nobody ready for him. This is a little bit different. Our quarterbacks are going to be asked to run, but certainly don't have quite the running skill set that Billy had. So the volume is not going to be quite as much. Are there going to be packages for uh, Adam Strauss again as a running quarterback, Jeff? Well, he's been moved to wide receiver. So Adam has made wide receiver, you know, he can always go back to quarterback and be our gun run quarterback, but he is such a talented athlete that we, we just had to find a spot to get him out there. He's a big, strong, fast, dynamic kid in space. And so for the team's benefit, it was much better for us to get him in the perimeter and now, you know, showcase him a little bit more than we could potentially a quarterback. With the new quarterback, Al, in that situation, would, how, does that give added importance to the running game this season? Well, again, I, I think, you know, unless you have a guy who's a three-year starter and you feel comfortable throwing the ball 50 times a game, 
you know, especially with young guys, you want to take a little bit of pressure off of them. So our ability to run the football, to be somewhat balanced, you know, just so people can't tee off on them all the time, to stay out of those predictable down and distances so we don't get into too many third and nines, I think is going to be invaluable. You know, so that's always going to be the basis of it. But he certainly doesn't restrict you on what you can ask him to throw, which is the good thing. So it's, it's not just strictly a pocket quarterback. He could throw very well from the pocket, but you put him outside, he could throw very well, you know, as a, as a rollout quarterback, as a bootleg quarterback, as a sprint quarterback. So he can kind of open up the paper because you're just not talking about a stationary guy. What, what do you like most about Torgerson? He is really, uh, we haven't had a throw, a pure throw. Probably have to go all the way back probably to Mike Mitchell back in the early 2000s. So he's got that rare ability to throw balls accurately, short, intermediate, long. He throws it with great touch. He has a rifle, so he can make all the throws you want thrown. And I think he understands, you know, what kind of balls need to be thrown. So he's not thrown 100 miles an hour on the undercuts and breaking a receiver's hands, but he knows on the deep curls, he's gunning it to make sure they can protect themselves. So he's really an exceptional thrower. He's a big, strong, physical kid. So, I mean, he's 215 pounds, so he's not small. And so he gives you enough of escapability, gives you enough of a run presence, uh, and he can make all the throws. He can make them out of the pocket. He can make them in the pocket. So he's got a tremendous upside. It's just now just getting more and more comfortable within our offense. That's a pretty high company to put him in. Well, again, you're asking me to evaluate him. Now, whether he has the career that Mike has, that's a whole other thing. But in terms of just ability to throw the football and make the throws, you probably have to go all the way back to Mitchell. As good a quarterback as Billy was, and Billy was a different kind of quarterback, but in terms of just throwing the ball, putting it on people with touch, deep, long, intermediate, he's, he's really gifted. Can you talk about the transition, uh, Spencer Coltar going from running back to wide receiver, mm -hmm. how that decision was made and what your expectations mm -hmm. are for him this season? Well, again, I think we got to formulate a package for Spencer. He's really a dynamic playmaker. And so we have to be smart that, hey, we can get balls to him on bubble screens, on speed sweeps. We can shift him back in the backfield. We can create the matchups that we want. Uh, he's uh, probably our best pure athlete on offense. And so he's probably the best guy we have in space. And as a result, we're going to have to make sure that he has, you know, 12 to 20 touches game plan every single week. They just get him out in space and let him do what he does. Yeah, I mean, we have the, uh, the benefit of having quite a few 50-year kids, he being one of them. So he not only is the guy that's going to be a go-to receiver, but he brings that leadership. He brings that maturity. He brings that game experience. And I think that's going to be critical as we try to get other kids game ready. He sets great example for those guys. And, you know, I think if he stays healthy, he's got a chance to really be a difference maker in this league. Now, what about your defense? Just your expectations hmm? for your defense? Well, they got a chance to be pretty good. Uh, again, we've been the beneficiaries of some 50-year kids back there. So you have Wilk and Jackson back in the secondary giving you tremendous leadership and seniority as 50-year guys. We have all league performer and you know Daniel Davis on the second level starters with you know Drake and Yakubi at the outside positions and then we have Taps and Connaughton you know up front so I, I think we have on all three levels some really experienced seasoned guy uh, you know so I think our secondary overall from top to bottom will probably be the strength of the defense there's probably six or seven guys that we can throw out there uh, that are all seasoned guys, that are all playmakers, that have all had extensive, you know, so experience and, and game action, and I think we can play quite a bit of man-to-man -man if we want to. A couple minutes ago, you said it was important to make the season about the players and not about mm -hmm. you because it's your last year. Yeah. How do you go about doing that? I never talk about me. You guys always <laughs> talk about me, so they hear the same message consistently that it's team. It's about them. It's you know, it's. We're going to have to deal with distractions. Now, distractions come in many forms. This is a distraction. You know, we tried to explain why we announced it so early, but in a perfect world, you want to announce it after Cornell. You know, not let it be a distraction, but that's not the way it unfolded. So we got to minimize and handle any distraction that it may cause. 
Uh, what qualities about Ray make him a good candidate to replace you? Well, I think he was, it was a logical choice. I mean, he's a good football coach. Uh, he knows Penn. Uh, he's been here longer than I have. You know, so I think he's got a terrific relationship with our administrative people, with our alumni base. He's a very good football coach, bright guy, you know, guy that's creative. And I think, you know, he was just a natural selection to kind of carry through. I think this is the next step of his evolution. And I think he'll be really good. I think sometimes change is beneficial. He'll get a different voice, even if it's the same message, it's said differently. And I think it, it protects our staff and really it, it kind of protects the, the continuity and the familiarity that our kids would have with their recruiting coaches and with the staff. So it was kind of a win, win, win. We're all excited for him. He work real hard at it. Uh, he'll, he'll really be active and he'll be involved. And, you know, I think he'll acquit himself very, very well. Thanks. All right. If the Quakers want to have a bounce back season in 2014 and send head coach Al Bagnoli into retirement with his 10th Ivy League championship, they will have to greatly improve upon last season's 4-5 and five record and 3-3 three and three mark in Ivy League play. Let's take a closer look at the Quakers' schedule. The Quakers kick off their season this Saturday at Jacksonville. Jacksonville is 1-1 so far this season and beat Pioneer Conference rival San Diego last week 35-18. Jacksonville finished 2013 with a 5-6 record. I think the Quakers have a good shot to win this game. Look for them to start 1-0. Then on September 27th, Penn will host their crosstown rival Villanova in their home opener. Villanova went 6-5 last year and finished 4th in the Colonial Athletic Conference. Last year, Villanova beat Penn 35-6. This may be another tough matchup for Penn. We'll see. On October 4th, in their first Ivy League game of 2013, the Quakers will take on the Big Green, who had a record of 6-4 in 2013, going 5-2 in Ivy League play. Last year, the Quakers defeated Dartmouth in a thriller 37-31 victory in the 4th overtime. I think Penn will have a good chance to beat Dartmouth again this year. On October 11th, Penn will be at Fordham. Last year, Fordham went 12-2 two and defeated Sacred Heart in the FCS playoffs before losing to Townsend in the second round. I think this will be a tough game for the Quakers. We'll have to see if they can pull off an upset. On October 18th, the Quakers will host Columbia. In 2013, Columbia went 0-10 and finished last in the Ivy League. Penn beat the Lions 21-7 last year. I would definitely expect another Penn victory over Columbia this season. On October 25th, Penn will be at Yale. Like Penn, Yale finished with a 3-4 record in Ivy League play last year, tied for fourth and finished 5-5 five five overall. Penn defeated the Bulldogs 28-17 in 2013, and I feel this is another game the Quakers will win this season. Following week on November 1st, Brown will pay a visit to Franklin Field on homecoming week. In 2013, Brown was also tied for fourth in the Ivy League with a 3-4 conference record while finishing 6-4. Last year, Brown easily defeated Penn 27-0. I think this will be a tough game for Penn this year. They're going to have to come ready to play if they want to have a chance to beat Brown and avenge last season's loss. On November 8th, Penn will be at Princeton. The Tigers were co-champions of the Ivy League last year, going 6-1 in conference play and finishing with an overall record of 8-2. In 2013, Penn fell short against the Tigers 38-26. I think this may be another tough game for Penn against what may be their toughest opponent all year. On November 15th, Penn will host Harvard, who was the other co-champion of the Ivy League in 2013, finishing with a 6-1 conference record while going 9-1 overall. Harvard beat Penn last year 38-30, and this is going to be a tough two-game stretch for the Quakers going against Princeton and Harvard in consecutive weeks. Hopefully they can find a way to win at least one of these two games. Then on November 22nd in their season finale, the Quakers will visit Cornell, who went 3-7 in 2013 with a 2-5 Ivy League record. Cornell finished in 7th place in the Ivy League last year and escaped with a 42-41 victory over Penn last year. I fully expect Penn to give a great effort in Coach Bagnoli's final game. Well, that does it for tonight's edition of Sports Wrap-Up on CSB9. I hope you enjoyed tonight's special show previewing the 2014 Penn Quakers football team. For the entire sports wrap-up crew, we want to thank the Penn Sports Network for helping us out with tonight's special episode. I'm Paul Kelly saying good night, and we'll see you on tomorrow's edition of Sports Wrap-Up.